All right, take your Bibles this morning and open to the book of 1 Corinthians. Now that I learned how to turn my microphone back on. <clears throat> um, so I was really looking forward to hearing Brother Stu and what is going on with their new ministry. Uh, they're doing a, a Spanish work in, uh, here in the state. Um, his wife is struggling with some serious physical issues. We want to keep them in prayer, keep her in prayer, uh, in addition to the COVID that they're dealing with. And so we want to, we want to lift them up. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is where we're going to begin this morning. And remember that Corinth is a church that is basically doctrinally defunct. Um, and it's one of the reassuring things to me, one of the comforting things to me about Corinth. And if you've never studied First and Second Corinthians, it's, it's a series of answers to questions in, or, or guidance on how to deal with problems because the Corinthian church was a mess. And, you know, we, we get into debates about, well, you know, this church or that church, we can't, we can't deal with them, we can't do baptism with them, we can't accept their baptism because they have drifted from the faith doctrinally, they may not be a church, except that Scripture says the only church threatened to lose a candlestick was actually the church at Ephesus, which was extremely doctrinally sound. And Jesus opens his letter by saying, I, I know your works, how you can try them to say they are apostles and are not. So they had a strong doctrinal basis, but he said, I have somewhat against you because you've left your first love. Now, this doesn't mean it's okay to not be right with biblical doctrine. And, and can I remind us all, we, we use that term, we throw that term out, and all it means is teaching. Doctrine means teaching. And we need to be solid in all of the teaching of Scripture. There's, there's nothing that is not important in this book. And it's important that we learn what God said and what the foundations of our faith are and how we're to function. The comforting part to me is that you can't find an example of a church more doctrinally, more teaching defunct than Corinth, and each letter begins with the ch to the church at Corinth. <laughs> so it means God is gracious. <laughs> we can have some things wrong for a time, and, and He will teach us, and if we're paying attention, we'll correct whatever we're deficient in, but He doesn't just write us off because we don't have it all correct. But I will tell us and tell anybody who's listening, the moment a church leaves their love for God, that's danger, real danger. I'm not saying it's okay to be wrong doctrinally. I'm saying we need to get that right. But God's importance first is love for Him and love for others. And He said on these two commandments, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving others as yourself, hang all the law and the prophets. If we get those two right, the rest will come along. We'll get those. It, the love for God and love for others will drive us to want to know what it is we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do, and what are the teachings of Christ that we need to live by. And so here is Paul writing to Corinth. They've got a nightmare of problems. Two letters are written, and he deals with so many different things. But there's a piece of this that we want to look at this morning because we've been talking about all the places, the different places in the Bible, where it says, you know, here's some scenario, but God. And one of those is actually right here. So beginning in verse 1, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye are not able, were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? So here the first thing we see is the carnal church admiring men. And they've chosen sides. Well, I'm, I was led to Christ by, by Apollo. I follow his teaching. Well, I follow the teachings of Paul. He says, that's carnality. And carnality is anything that is away from God. Anything that we as Christians do not tend to with God, do not focus on God, do not make God first, is carnality because we're thinking like the world thinks. 
Isn't that the way the world goes? We have people we put on pedestals and, and oh, well, you know this person, I know this person, I know this person. How many people do you know that drop names? Well, I know so-and-so. You know, and now, so-and-so may not know them, but I know so-and-so. I tease about that. I, I had the privilege of shaking two vice presidents' hands when I was in the service. And, and it was cool. Not so much I wasn't ever going to wash my hand or anything like that. But I can say, you know, I know two vice presidents. Now go ask them if they know me. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm one of millions of hands that they should because that's their job. When they go somewhere, there's a crowd of people and they shake hands. And, and especially in the military because everybody wants to meet the vice president. And if you get a chance to meet the president, he's your commander in chief. And so, you know, but people drop names because they admire these people. They think, oh, this is great. Now, there's nothing wrong with seeing people that do great things and wanting to emulate to some extent what they do, their, their life. There are preachers that I have admired through the years, not idolized, not, you know, just, oh, they're the greatest thing. But there's been preachers I look at and I see things in their life that are so profound with God. And I think, okay, I want to know how they got there because that's, that's where I want to be with God. I want to be like that with God. I want to be close to them. I want to learn from them. They have more experience, more time than I do. And I want to learn from them. And there's some men that are just such gifted teachers. You're probably not supposed to do this, but David Jeremiah can paint pictures with words better than any human I know. I don't agree with everything he says, but his ability to speak is tremendous. People like that, I think, I want to learn how to speak like that. I want to learn how to use words. I want to learn how to paint a picture with my words. I'm not going to idolize him. I'm not going to say, well, I've learned to preach by following David Jeremiah. Paul says, you're carnal. You're just thinking like the world. You're picking people and going, oh, I'm like, I follow them, so I'm going to be like them. Who are we supposed to be following? Jesus Christ. We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school. We're, We're in Ephesians where he talks about servants working for their masters as unto God and for for masters to lead, to manage as unto God. And talk about the only way we're going to do that, if we want to emulate Jesus, one of the things we have to do is we've got to get into the Gospels and we've got to read them over and over and over and over because if we're going to be like Jesus, we have to learn how He spoke, how He acted, what was important to Him, how He dealt with different situations. If we want to be like Him, we have to learn what He is. That's the one we need to emulate. That's the one we need to try to be like. That's the one we need to say, I am of Jesus. How many of you know Leon Hill from Broken Arrow? Pastor Leon Hill, First Baptist Church, Broken Arrow, back in the 70s. How many of y'all know that name? Yeah, most people don't. That was a pastor when I got saved, when I trusted Christ. That was a pastor. Um, how many of you know who, um, um, what was Brother Gray's name, baby girl? Um, Bob Gray. How many of you know Bob Gray from Florida, not the crazy one from down south here. Um, but the one that was in Florida for 40 years or so. I mean, have you, I mean, yeah, he's dead and gone. How many of you know the life of Billy Sunday? One besides me. Two. Two besides me. So three of us. How many of you know who Jesus is? Wow. So the one we need to be emulating and following is Jesus Christ. And when our eyes are on somebody else, and I'm, you know, listen, we have mentors, we need mentors. That's a smart thing to do. You have somebody who is spiritual, who is more mature to help guide us, help bring us along to Jesus. Not the person. Jesus. He said, listen, you're carnal. Church, you're carnal. I'm trying to give you meat, but I can't. Well, when, when we planted so long ago, You haven't ever grown. You're still on the milk. I'd like to teach you some really deep truths, but I can't. i got to still feed you some milk. He says, so here's the the first thing. You're carnal. And you need to understand it's God that gives the increase. In verse 5, he said, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase, but God gave the increase. So neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. 
He said, all this stuff you're doing, all this, all this worshiping of humans, who, who can forgive sins? What man can forgive sins? None. What name given among men can redeem, can forgive sins? What name? Only Jesus. So who is the person? I admire the way David Jeremiah speaks, but is David Jeremiah anything? Just a man. Just a man. I'm just a man. The greatest preachers that we enjoy are just men. And no matter how gifted they are, no matter how good they are in, in exegesis, no matter how good they are in delivering a message, not one man can save one sin. Only Jesus. God gives the increase. That relieves us. Do you realize? That takes the burden off of us. Our duty is to just plant the gospel seed or to water it in somebody who's already heard. Our job is just to put the message out there. God's job is to stir the heart and draw them to Him and then to open their mind to understand so they can trust the gospel message that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He came and died on a cross, was buried and rose again the third day, paying the price for sin. Our duty, our job is simply to tell Others, the good news of Jesus Christ. If they reject the gospel, they haven't rejected us, they've rejected God. And for me to go away, I, I'm going to go away sorrowful when somebody doesn't trust Christ because I know what awaits them. But I do not have to go away feeling guilty or feeling sorrowful because I failed. My job before God is to just tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. If they accept, I didn't do it. I shared the message, God does the saving. God gives the increase. Not me, God. Not you, God. No great man, no great woman. God gives the increase. That relieves us of all the burden. So we can freely obey God and go tell people, Jesus saves. The increase comes from God. And sometimes He allows us to be the witness of that transition. Sometimes we get to be the ones who give the message and watch someone go, that's the truth and that's what I need to do. And we have the joy, the blessing of being there present when they say, I trust you. Forgive me of my sins and be my Savior. We watch them when they're gloriously reborn into the kingdom of God. But even when we get to witness that, we didn't do the saving. All we did was bring a message. We either planted a little or we watered a little, but when it comes to fruition, it's all God. He says, so you got to get out of this man stuff. you got to remember that God's the one who gives the increase. It doesn't matter who the man is, only God gives the increase. But there's a reward for these builders. These workers are builders in the kingdom of heaven. We are builders in the kingdom of heaven. Do you realize that? We are building. We are laying precious stones. We are, we are increasing the kingdom when we obey God and go share the gospel. And when we share the love of Christ, when we help Christians grow, when we, when we introduce people to Jesus and they get saved, we are building the kingdom. Paul says this in verse 8, he says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, shall be made visible, for the day shall declare, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. There's a day coming when each of us as children of God will stand before Jesus Christ in what's called the Bema Seat or the Judgment Seat of Christ. It's a reward time. It is a time where God takes all of our works, tries them in the fire of His grace, and what we do for Him, the things we do to further the kingdom, those are things that we build with that are the gold and the silver and the precious stones. But the things we did for attention, the things we did for us, the things we did to try to look good, the things that we did for some other reason than honoring and glorifying God are going to burn up like wood, hay, and stubble in the fire. And those things, we're going to suffer loss. Because the Bible calls our reward a single reward. But we can have a full reward, or we can have a partial reward, or I'm assuming we can have no reward if we don't do anything for God. And in that day, everything we've done is going to be tried by fire. And I love what he said here. So if our stuff burns up because it wasn't done for God, we will still be saved. We can't lose our salvation. Even if we get saved and we do nothing more for God, we are still saved. And we're going to be in heaven. And we're going to survive this judgment. See, but it's going to be as through fire. And listen, I think this is going to be an important day in our life because this is the day when it's going to be revealed how much we love Jesus. I, I've said it many times before, if you, if you have a mate and you tell your mate you love him, but you never do anything to demonstrate that love, you never pat them. You never bring them things just randomly for no reason other than to say, I love you. If you don't protect them, if you don't talk to them, if you don't invest in them, what evidence is there of the love? The evidence of our love for Christ is in our actions. Christ took action to demonstrate His love for us. He is still taking action to demonstrate His love for us. The moment we trust Christ, there's a moment we say, yes, Jesus, I believe, I trust you, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, be my Savior, whatever words you said that got to that same place. The moment we do that, we are indwelled by Christ. We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. He takes up residence in us. He is still taking action by teaching and guiding and convicting he still takes action as He blesses us with resources, blesses us with jobs, with homes, with friends, with family, with the church. He is still demonstrating His love for us. The fact that He left this book for us so we can see with our own eyes and hear with our own ears that Jesus loves us, that God loves us. He is still actively loving us. And the way we can show that is by actively loving Him, by loving others, by dedicating ourselves to God, by reading His Word, by helping people who are in need, by giving the Gospel, by teaching classes, by doing all the different things that go on here, whether that is blowing the leaves off the sidewalk so that our place looks nice when people come in, or playing instruments, or being faithful, quietly working behind the scenes, prepping food, ministering to people, serving people, quietly walking up to those who we know are in need and shaking their hands and saying good morning and leaving a little bit of money in their hand. Or by asking God, what would you like me to give towards missions? And then writing that number down and turning that in and faithfully giving that every month. Giving our tithes faithfully. Giving of our time. That's the hard one, isn't it? Really and truly. 
I mean, we're already here on certain times, certain service times, but given our time outside of that, tending to people when they're truly in need, going and sitting with somebody when they are struggling, going investing. You know, last week, Mike Piercy brought a fantastic message about getting down in the pain, in the hurt, getting down where these people are living, talking about fostering, talking about the widows and the orphan, and it talks about visiting them in their affliction. Not, not going by and waving as you go by, but actually getting down and going through the pain with them, sitting with them, crying with them that that's what is necessary, tending, make sure they have everything that they need. Those are things that we do that actively show our love for God. But God gives the increase. And sometimes we forget there is increase beyond people getting saved. I will tell you as a pastor, I've had times in my life where I've looked, and, and even since I've been here, looked where we had times where we, we didn't have any we didn't have the, the physical growth. We didn't see numbers increasing. And, and it gets discouraging. You think, oh God, what, do I, what am I missing? What am I not doing? What, what is wrong? And, and, then, and I'm grateful for people like Mike Piercy because I was talking to him one day and I said, I'm just struggling. I don't know if, 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 I'm, if I'm failing as a pastor, failing as a leader, but we're just not, we don't seem to be growing. And he said, are you sure that's the only growth? Are you people growing spiritually? And I had to step back and go, ooh, wait a minute. I'm watching people turning on to Jesus. I'm watching people getting engaged. People who weren't in ministry who are now in ministry. That's spiritual growth. That's growth. I am so stuck in the tradition of growth means you add numbers. I'm so stuck there that that's the only way I can see growth. I had to grow up a little bit. I had a dear friend who sent me and counseled me and says, you need to look past numbers. You need to look at the people. Are they growing in Christ? And praise God, we are. And God grants us people occasionally. God gives the increase, both spiritually and physically. He says, get your eyes off people. You're here to build for the kingdom. You're here to love people, to love God, and minister to whoever is in need, to encourage one another, to lift each other up, and be a part of each other's lives, and do things that honor God. That's planting, that is, that is watering, that is building stones on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Because we are living stones, and we can grow. Unlike a rock that just sits. We can actually grow in Christ, become more effective, become more impactful. There's a reward for honoring God. And listen, when it comes to this mission thing, there's a reward for us giving to missions. There's an honoring that God does when we give to missions. That's part of our building. But it's even more fun than that. In Philippians chapter 4, he's writing to the Philippians to try to help them understand that even though he's in jail, he's okay. And, the, and, and God's message is still going. The gospel is still being preached. And he takes some time to tell them thank you because they sent Epaphroditus there with some resources for him. And he, and he says in verse 8, now I'm sorry, in verse 15, I looked at the wrong verse. He says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once again to my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that it may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by, Jesus, by Christ Jesus. And unto God and the Father, glory be uh, forever and uh, be glory forever and ever. Amen. So look at what he tells him. He says, "Look, he says, I want you to understand your faithfulness and what it's meant to me. You, after I left Macedonia, no church, no church sent me anything to help me out. He's not begging. He's not whining here. He's letting the Philippians know what God has done with them. He said, "No church communicated with me as far as sending me resources." Except you. Even when I was in Thessalonica, way over yonder, 
you sent time and again. And he says, not that I desire fruit, but the fruit may abound to your account. Do you realize what he just told them? Hey, Philippians, the money that you send to me so I can continue to preach and minister the gospel, all the people that are saved, those people that trust Christ through the ministry God has sent me here to, those fruits abound to your account. You, we have a, we get, we get sometimes a messed up idea about things. We, we think that we hire preachers and we hire missionaries. We don't hire preachers. Folks, I'm not a hireling. I'm a pastor. I'm a minister of the gospel. You didn't hire me. You have the privilege, I hope it's a privilege to you, to take care of my financial needs so I can do what I'm doing. This isn't a job. This is a surrendered ministry. Our missionaries that are on the field, we're not hiring them to go out. God has called them to go out. Our privilege is to contribute to their financial needs so they don't have to worry about it. So I don't have to wonder, am I going to have enough food today? Am I going to have enough money to pay my rent today? Am I going to be able to put gas in my car this week? Am I going to be able to travel? If I have to go to the doctor, can I afford it? Am I going to be able to, to buy medicine? We give so they don't have to worry about that part of their life, so they can wholly dedicate to serving Jesus. It's a privilege. It's an honor that we get to partake in God's work through other people. Mike Piercy starting a new ministry. He's going to need some help. Karis needs some help. They're ministering to people and they peek out their, they peek out their resources. If they have more resources, they can help even more people. Danny Fudge is doing a great work in Nebraska. And while his church is growing, and soon will be totally independent and not need resources from anybody. Right now, he still needs a little help to make sure he has the money so he can live his life and, and not worry about that while he ministers the gospel. We have this opportunity. This is what faith promise is all about. We ask God for an amount, and we give that amount knowing God is going to use that. And everyone that we support, everything they accomplish for God, we get partial credit for that. We get fruit from that. People that come to know the Lord, we get fruit from that because we're helping keep the missionary on the field to do that work. And because of that, because of our faithfulness to help, God puts that towards our account also. That's what Paul just said. Not that I desire fruit, but that fruit may abound to your account. But then he tells them, listen, I know this is a sacrifice for you to give, but listen, my God, the God we love, the God we serve, my God shall supply all your needs in Christ. So if you think, well, I don't know if I do this, I mean, God gave me an amount I'm not sure about. My God will supply all your needs. Just obey Him and give what God tells you. How many of you have been doing faith promise? And this is not to call you out, I'm not going to call your names. Has anybody who's done faith promise, has God ever failed to take care of you? Has God ever missed a, a payday? Has God ever made you go hungry because you chose to give extra? My wife and I have, have given to faith promise for, for decades now. And we're always amazed at what God does and how God does. God always takes care of His children. And the more we obey, the more blessing God pours out. The more we get serious with Him, the more He pours on us. The more we give, the more God gives to us. Because we are a willing vessel for Him to work through us. Now don't take that and get this name it and claim it idea that, well, if I give a dollar, I get $10 back. If I ever get $100, I get $10,000 back. Oh, if I open my home to a missionary, I'm going to get three homes. That's not how this works. First of all, God is far more blessing than that. And not all of our blessings come in the form of, oh, I gave $100, so I got $1,000 back, or 100 times that, I got, I got 10000 whatever. Sometimes that is, your car didn't break down. I can't tell you how many old cars we've driven. Still drive. My pickup's the newest thing that we have. Suburban has 340,000 miles on it. 
it, it should rightfully be just dead as a doornail. But you know, God has always provided what we've needed to fix it. When something breaks, God always takes care of that. Sometimes that's through you. You have done things to help me take care of my vehicle. See, God blesses through His people. Sometimes it means you don't get sick. Or you don't ever have an illness that requires a hospital and huge, huge bills. I'm not saying that will never happen. I'm saying sometimes if you get faithful in giving, you will look back over the last few years and go, wow, God has not only blessed through finances, but, you know, we haven't, had, we haven't had to do this, we haven't had this, but we haven't, you know, other people are talking about, well, this is bad, this is bad, and yet that, that's not happened. Because God blesses in more ways than just giving you dollars back. God blesses in ways that only God can explain and only you can understand because some of the blessings are internal and there's no way to explain them. There's no way that you can share what God has done in your heart. You can sit and talk with people and go, I know what you're saying, but I don't know how to explain it. God blesses in amazing ways, and He does so when we're faithful to Him. And listen, it's not just about money. Give your time and watch what God does in giving your time back to you. Give your talents and watch what God does through you with your talents. Watch what God does in your life for every area of our lives that we give to God. Watch God bless in that specific area every single time. He does amazing things. Then Paul tells him, listen, you need to understand that the glory belongs to the Lord. In verse 16 he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in in you. That's an important verse for us because sometimes we get so hung up in this building, we think this is the house of God, this is the temple of God. We are the temple of God. This is a tool for God. We are the temple. This is where the Holy Spirit rests. He doesn't come into here and fill it up with, the, with His Shekinah glory cloud and drive us out to the fellowship hall. He's already here. We talked about this in Sunday school, and I've mentioned it, may have mentioned it here. I don't remember because I'm sharing with different people, and I forget who I've shared with. But remember years ago in his steps came out, and then somewhere around the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, the WWJD came out. What would Jesus do? And, and it was the grandson of the guy who wrote the book originally, and he put out What Would Jesus Do? It's just a reprint of In His Steps. And everybody got the little bracelets. And I was talking to my teens. I was, I was in... Uh, Dirks, Arkansas at the time, and, and we, had a, we had a really large teen group, and we were talking about this, because everybody was getting this book, and they were reading all this, and they are like, this is so great. I said, great, well, let's take it to the next step. Because the whole premise is, what would you do if Jesus was standing here? What would you do? What decision would you make? What would you, if Jesus walked in your door, what would you hide? What would you turn off? What would you not want Jesus to see? I said, that's all well and good. That's great. It's a kind of a great mindset. But here, let's just get it down to where the real truth is. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, Jesus lives inside. So the question is not, what would you do if Jesus was here? The question is, Jesus is here. What are you going to do? What are you going to watch? What are you going to read? What are you going to say? How are you going to act? Where are you going to go? Because wherever you go, whatever you, however you act, whatever you say, you're using the body of Christ. You belong to Jesus now. He bought you with His blood, with His sacrifice. We belong to Him. He dwells in us. So whatever we watch, whatever we say, whatever we do, we're causing the body of Christ to do. So the question is not, what would you do if? The question is, He's here, what will you do? He said, listen, you've got to understand, you're the temple of God. God is the one who gets the glory. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain, they are useless. Therefore let no man glory in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. 
What the Son gets, we get. Because we are Christ. And Christ is God's. He said, but there's some requirements for these builders. The glory goes to God. What you build honors God. And the things you build that honor God will pass the fire and will be a reward for you. But then he says in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Keep that phrase, stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So, but with me, it's a very small thing that should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet I am hereby justified by, by he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and men, and then shall every man have praise of God. He says, so listen, if you're going to be a builder, you have to be faithful. Moreover, it's required of a steward that he be found faithful. And so oftentimes preachers use this verse to talk about Money, giving your tithe, giving gifts above the tithe, faith promise. This is not talking about money. The application is right, that we have to be faithful with everything God gives us. But these verses are specifically talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are all stewards of the gospel. We carry this word in us. And we are to be the ministers of the gospel to those around us. And God is telling us through Paul right here, moreover is required of stewards, of you and me as children of God, that we be found faithful. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. We must be faithful. We must be faithful in everything. We must be faithful to gather together as His church. We must be faithful to bring up our families in the nurture and admonition of God. We must be faithful to pray. We must be faithful to read and study. We must be faithful to share His gospel. We must be faithful to encourage and lift others around us. We must be faithful to tend to the widows and the fatherless in their affliction. We must be faithful to give of our resources. Whether that is food or money or our time, we must be faithful in that. We must be faithful because we are the stewards and a far more than just a tithe or a faith promise. Faithfulness is so much deeper than that. God wants all of us, not part, all. You know, there's, there's, an old, there's an old fun line from preachers that says it, it takes three books to worship God. The hymn book, the good book, and your pocketbook. There's some truth in that. We want to give God everything but our pocketbook. Or we want to give everything but our total time. And I got news for us. If we, whatever we give to God, whatever we faithfully dedicate to God, He will take care of. If you're like me and you like to hunt, fish, things like that, you give your time to God, God will make time for you. If you want to make sure that you take care of your family, give your money to God first. And God will make sure you have everything you need. But my gosh, I supply all your needs according to His Riches and glory in Christ Jesus. If you want to have, if you want to have a sweet relationship with your mate, give your relationship to God and watch what He does with it. If you want to have a good relationship with your children, give that relationship to God and watch what God does with it. In fact, if you just want things to go as, as close to really fantastic as they can be, give your children to God. When they get here, just give them back to God, recognizing that they are lent to us by God. We get the opportunity to raise them. You want to be a better musician? Give your talent to God and use it for Him and watch what God does to grow you in it. Are you a teacher? 
Give that to God. Let God guide your teaching and watch what he does with it. Whatever it is in our lives that we have, give it to God faithfully and watch what God does. And specifically this month, you want to have some financial fun? Dedicate to faith promise. Let God give you an amount and then give it. And watch what God does. It is amazing and it's fun to watch God work. God does amazing things. Have you read his word? He makes donkeys talk to people. He makes the shadow go back up a staircase without stopping the earth. He adds daylight. What a crazy thing is that? Imagine if he just stopped everything. I mean, we're whirling at what? 24,000 miles an hour, what it is? Or 1,000 miles an hour? 24 hours to a day, we're about 1,000 miles in circumference. Isn't that what it is? Or, or no, that's not how, however it works. It's, we're cruising. We're spinning fast, so every time we spend 24 hours, we cover the entire circumference of the earth and we get to see the sun again. And all of that is swirling around the sun and all of this is flying through space at unbelievable speeds. And God just went, okay, we'll just add some time. If he just went, we'd probably go, ding! Talk about violating gravity. Stop the spinning of the earth and watch what happens to us. Talk about your car wreck. You see, God does amazing things. God does miraculous things. He took how many soldiers of Gideon? How many? And he went against 30,000. And Gideon was still scared, remember? He said, okay, so let me, let me I want to verify I, I know what you told me. I believe what you told me, but I want to be sure that this victory is really ours. So he puts the fleece out, you know, the two different times. But, but then he's still struggling. And so he tells him, hey, you take your aid and you go down here and you circle around the mountain and you go check out this camp. And he hears them talking, man, I had a dream. And this, this biscuit, this cookie rolled down the hill and it crushed the tent. It must be Gideon going to destroy us. And dream after dream, people are talking about, well, it must mean Gideon's going to kill us all. So when Gideon shows up with his little, his little band of rebels with their clay pot with a candle in it and their trumpet, and they shout at his, and they come in all different directions, so it seems like they're surrounded. They shout the sword of the Lord of Gideon. Break their pictures. All of a sudden, they got candlelight everywhere. they got these, they got these flames going everywhere. And what happens to the Midianites? They kill themselves. They jump up, start stabbing each other. And the ones that took off, they chased them down. There's a comedian jokes about doing this as a news broadcast. He said, put to rout the entire Midianite army. And one, talking to one of them, said, sure we ran. You ever heard Gideon's boys play trumpet? They're terrible. God put to rout a massive army because he can. You want to experience some crazy things with God, give Say, God, I want to be part of missions. I want to be part of all these guys that go out to all these crazy places and just serve you, totally surrender. I just want to be a part of what they're doing. And so I'm going to give. What do you want me to give? And God, challenge me. Give me a number that makes me take my breath and go, oh, really? Write it down. And give it. God will not let you down nor will he go against his word. God said, give, and it shall be given. Give, it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, flowing over. Shall men give unto your bosom. You want to see what God can do? Challenge him. You say, we're not supposed to challenge God. I don't know. God's the one that said, try me. Prove me, test me, and see if I won't do what I say. This isn't an ungodly thing. This is saying, okay, God, you gave me this, I'm giving it, I'm going to trust you. 
I'm going to give you my time. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give you my resource. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give you everything that I am, and I'm going to trust you. And watch what God does. Watch what God does. Now, listen, this only works if you're a child of God. The blessings of God come from God. And these things we're talking about today are what happens when the children of God obey God and challenge God. If we've never trusted Christ as our Savior, these things aren't available to you yet. We need to first come to Christ and acknowledge the fact that He is the sinless Son of God and that our sin is the reason we're in trouble. We're born in sin. We do bad things because we're born in sin. We don't become sinners because we do bad things. We do bad things because we're born sinners. Because of that, we're separated from God. But God loves us so much that He gave Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, to die on a cross to pay that price. There's nothing we can offer. There's nothing we can do. He offers it as a free gift, and all we have to do is trust Him. We accept that gift by putting our trust in Jesus Christ. If you have not done that, I beg you today, Jesus, save me. I am a sinner. Forgive me and be my Savior. I trust you. Would you do that today? Then you can walk out of here knowing for eternity you are secure and can never be lost. Father God, as we finish out this portion of our day, Father, we ask that you would touch hearts and guide us in whatever we need to do, whether that is, whether that is to move into full faith and trusting you with every part of our life, or that is coming to you and trusting Christ as our Savior because we've never been there before. Father, whatever it is, help us. Help us put away the pride and everything else and help us to serve you. Help us to trust you, not only for salvation, but then to trust you as we live day by day for you, learning how to live like you and be like you, trusting your Spirit to guide us and to correct us and to mold us wherever we need to go. Father, we thank you and praise you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.